All right, so uh, we meet between the upper and lower parking lots and then take a few hours to walk the Nature Center trails. Uh, Bill Dininger, Dave Grass Kemper, and Ken Gober are our leaders for the walk. Uh, last year in April, we saw barred owls, Easterwood peewees, yellow bellied sapsuckers, ruby and golden crown kinglets, tree swallows, yellow rumped warblers, a pine warbler, and this Eastern tohi pictured here. Next slide, please. Nice. All right, this past second Saturday was held on March 12th, and here is Bill Dininger's report. He says that the March 2022 second Saturday of the month bird walk started at 9 a.m. with a temperature at 21 degrees. It was windy with some sun. 17 observers walked and watched until 11.45 a.m. The group had 29 species. There were several highlights, including our resident barred owl, Three pileated woodpeckers were observed. We had our first of the year Eastern Phoebe actively feeding. There were 35 estimated American robins feeding and flying in several locations. My favorite bird was a fox sparrow that was at the Nature Center feeding station. The fox sparrow was within one foot of the building. We had great unobstructed, extremely close views, as you can tell by the, the photo there. Very close picture. All right, next slide. And Nancy, the bottom seems to be cut off again. Do you have a pop-up you need to close? There we go. There we go, thank you. All right. All right, the March virtual field trip uh, took place at Big Creek Reservation in search of migrating waterfowl. However, we have had some surprises like a red-shouldered hawk nest. The virtual meetup during which I will present the scrapbook of everyone's photos, journaling, and bird list takes place the second Wednesday of the month, which means it is taking place on April 13th at 7 p.m. If you visited the location and have something to submit to me, please do so by this Friday so that I can get your items into the scrapbook. Even if you didn't have a chance to visit the reservation last month, you are still more than welcome to attend the Zoom meetup in which I will share the scrapbook for discussion. Please register at Eventbrite, and I'll put the Eventbrite link in the chat after I'm done with my announcements. Next slide, please. All right, uh, this month, the virtual field trip takes place at Foreign Meadows in search of killdeer, Wilson snipe, and American woodcock. During your visit to the park, I encourage you to take photographs, tally identified species, and or journal your experience. Send your items to me and your contribution will be published to a scrapbook and shared on our website and on social media. We will also have an optional Zoom meetup to share our experiences and take a look at the scrapbook. You can register for the meetup on Eventbrite. Again, I'll put this link in the chat momentarily. All right, I would also like to announce that April's virtual field trip will be our last one in the series. The virtual field trip program, which launched in July 2020, was created as an option for engaging with nature and community while adhering to social distancing guidelines necessitated by COVID-19. With the CDC's downgrade of much of Ohio's COVID-19 community levels to low, and with the availability of vaccine combined with other precautions like masking, we believe the virtual field trip program has served its purpose and is ready to be retired. Hired. We hope that you will alternatively join us for an in-person bird walk. Uh, next slide, please. And Nancy, it's still cut off at the bottom. I don't know if it... Well, <laughs> I'll continue, but I just want to let you know. Go. There you go. Okay. All right, um, so the Tremont Towpath Trail Urban Bird Walks. Please join us the fourth Saturday of every month for the Tremont Towpath Trail Urban Bird Walks. We are running these walks through October this year. We meet at the Cleveland Metro Parks parking lot on Abbey Avenue, just west of Sokolowski's University Inn. From there, your bird walk leaders, Nancy Howell and Al Rand, will guide you north through the Scranton Flats area of the towpath. The next walk is Saturday, April 23rd at 9 a.m. So be sure to mark your calendar. This past Tremont walk on March 26th, the group saw Kildeer, Double Crested Cormorant, Cooper's Hawk, Northern Flicker, and Northern Mockingbird. Next slide, please. All right, our popular Woodcock watches are back for a second season. They will run every Wednesday through April 27th at 7.30 p.m. We meet at Main Street in Strongsville at the railroad tracks halfway between Eastland Road and Big Creek Parkway. Nancy Howell is leading this watch. Registration is required for this event as we will counsel for inclement weather. So please register so that you will receive our communications. 
Uh, please watch for details and registration in our weekly emails. If you don't receive our emails and would like to, uh, please send us a note to info at wcaudubon.org and we'll get you on that list. Next slide, please. All right, uh, please stay connected with us in between our virtual and in-person activities by following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Be sure to use hashtag WC Audubon when you post a bird photo to Instagram for a chance to be featured on our Instagram page. If selected, I will reach out to you with details. Also, many of our virtual programs are recorded like the speaker series meeting and our virtual field trips that I mentioned and can be found on our WC Audubon YouTube channel, so be sure to subscribe. All right, next slide. All right, so the special event I mentioned, Biggest Day with David Lindo. Uh, so David Lindo, the urban birder, is coming back to the U.S. as a keynote speaker for the biggest week in American birding and has decided to visit us in Northeast Ohio for Biggest Day with David Lindo, a day of bird walks and other activities with David. We are still planning the details, so please mark your calendar for May 20th and stay tuned for more. Next slide, please. Oh, that's it for me. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Michelle. And please do mark your calendar. We have some really, really fun activities, bird walks, lunch, dinner with David, and uh, it should be great to, to chat with him again. He is our ambassador our, uh, to Western Cuyahoga from Europe. How about that? Alrighty, now I'm going to get, introduce uh, Drina Nemes, um, who is, is, leads our book discussion. And Drina, how are you this evening? Nancy, I'm good, thank you. Um, for the 21-22 season, we had a variety of topics and they have been really good books. And this next book that we're reading, which Nancy recommended, is, is a winner. Um, it's three weeks from tonight, from seven to eight, and you can register it at the WCAC site. If you're looking for a, a copy, check out your library because they do have audio, hard copy, and electronic. And just recently, um, in looking for some other information, I found a fantastic This American Life podcast. They're so good, that series. And this one from August of, I think, 2018, uh, it is about the book and also it features the author, Kirk Wallace Johnson. So it's 62 minutes and it covers the book very well. And in case you might prefer that uh, as a way to learn about the book. Um, next slide, please. This is quite an exciting book and it really is about crime. As it turns out, there were detectives working on the story, but our author becomes one of the key detectives as he investigates the whole story after the fact. And then he takes on another aspect to his work and he becomes a detective for trying to figure out where are the rest of these bird skins that were stolen and never returned. And it takes him around the world. And the author really is in a kind of pursuit of justice. Uh, and I, I really admire the energy that he put into this. Next slide, please. Well, this bird is about feathers. And as you read the book and you hear about some of these feathers, they become just such sources of beauty and delight. And perhaps you can imagine how these fly tires who use feathers for, tie, for making ties for fishing would become obsessed with some of these. Now here's a, a greater bird of paradise. And this was one, one of the birds that was Many of the birds of this species were stolen from the museum. Uh, they were prized possessions. And some of them were stolen from the collection of Alfred Russell Wallace, who had collected them in the mid 19th century. So such a beautiful, uh, such a beautiful bird. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to include a couple more because these are birds are so beautiful. And um, 
can see why perhaps people would want these feathers. Um, I came across a, a couple of common names, blue chatterer and um, actually Indian crow. And I had not heard those before and they really don't come up on eBird. But blue chatterer and Indian crow are the terms used by uh, those who sell feathers legally or illegally. And uh, blue chatterer refers to the Cotinga birds species, those that are blue and there are about seven of them. And there's one featured here. And then the um, red ruffed fruit crow is the common name in eBird. Um, and that's referred to as the Indian crow. And it too has magnificent feathers. So there are so many other uh, birds and their beautiful feathers that are brought up in the story. And please join us uh, three weeks from tonight. Thank you. Thanks so much, Trina. Look at those birds. Wow. It is an exciting story, that's for sure. And you will have a hard time putting the book down. All righty, I do want to mention a couple of other things that we have for sale on the Western Cuyahoga Audubon website. Um, we uh, are partnering with Tilth Soil, which is produced uh, in Cleveland by Rust Belt Riders. What they do is they collect food waste uh, from restaurants, from households, and do industrial composting. Um, they have soil for gardens, they have soil for house plants, they have soil for uh, starting seedlings. So you can check out our website. Um, I actually purchased a couple of large bags for some um, uh, pots that I have outside where I'm going to put vegetables and I have some seeds started in their in their seed starting soil and everything's looking really good right now. Um, but just think about it so much of that the food waste goes into landfills, but they will take it and actually turn it into usable beautiful soil. And of course, um, with spring coming along, how about some ice cream? Uh, Western Cuyahoga does sell uh, the gift cards from Mitchell's Ice Cream at $10 denominations. And you know, Easter's coming up. So maybe think about tucking one to, into an Easter basket. We have a few uh, cards on hand right now so they can get into your hands in the next day or so. Um, but of course, if you haven't had Mitchell's, they not only have ice cream, but frozen yogurt, sorbet, and even vegan ice cream. So check out again the Western Cuyahoga Audubon store. And Amanda, thank you for being our coffee coordinator. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Um, next slide. Um, I just wanted to urge everyone to please get orders in uh, this month because uh, we're only going to be taking orders every three months after April. We found that we weren't able to get enough orders so that uh, we could get the free shipping and it significantly cut into uh, any money that we might make and the money is used to uh, further our mission. Um, when you buy this coffee, you're really helping birds and you're helping the farmers down in uh, Central and South America. And you're, you're helping the land be uh, saved by making it organic. They farm organically. They uh, keep native um, um, canopies and um, it's just a really good product. So um, I hope everyone will consider putting an order in by April 10th. And um, because we're not going to have any more orders for a while, they really seal their product well, and it'll keep. So thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda. And it's good coffee too. There's a wide variety. Again, check out our website. I want to talk a little bit about our upcoming meetings. Um, next month on Tuesday, May 3rd, uh, Bruce Buckingham is going to be talking about the 
Lake Erie Herring Gull Project. I was unaware of it until I read, um, I think it was the Ohio Ornithological Newsletter, and I'm like, oh, wow, this sounded fascinating. So there's some gull banding and people are figuring out where the gulls are going and why they hang around Lake Erie, where they go when they're not hanging around Lake Erie. So I hope that you'll join us Tuesday, May 3rd, 7.30. Again, it is it will be virtual. But as I mentioned earlier, that our uh, picnic, bird walk, and plant exchange will be happening in person on Tuesday, June 7th. I know I mentioned it earlier and I wanted to say it again because we hope that you could all attend. But I know this evening you are here to listen to Dr. Laura Rokotenets, who is the manager of the University of Akron Field Station at the Bath Nature Preserve. Um, she utilizes birds to share nature with, with people um, there at the station. Uh, she's an instructor at the University of Akron, a biology instructor. And um, what, what drew me to this is how she utilizes, again, the outdoors to get people uh, interested in nature, to fascinated by nature. And uh, so, and again, birds are just one of the ways that we can get people involved. Um, she works with students of all ages, uh, not, not just the university students, but um, other students. And she's, they've written a book uh, about birds of the Bath Nature Preserve. And I hope she talks a little bit about that this evening. Um, but she also has a collection of, I believe they're antique, uh, mounted or stuffed birds, and she's excited about sharing that information with us this evening as well. So I am going to stop sharing, and hopefully Laura will be able to, or Laura will be able to get on and be able to share her uh, screen. So take it away. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Nancy, for inviting me to be here tonight. I'm just thrilled to see some familiar faces and to see some new folks. And I'm excited to tell you about what we've been up to down at the University of Akron Field Station and how that it relates to birds. So I'm gonna share my screen here um, and we'll get started sharing lots of pictures. Okay, so hopefully that's working. I'm that gonna, looks great. Great, okay, good. Um, so here, uh, I work at the University of Akron Field Station, which our main base of operations is in Bath Nature Preserve. Um, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about our other two properties, too, just in case you haven't heard of them. So uh, we have kind of a three tier mission at the University of Akron uh, Field Station, and that's that we do long term environmental research there. And uh, we have students, graduate students at the university, undergraduate students and professors at the university doing research there. We wanna interact with the local community and provide you know, some information about the environment, our local nature, nature in our backyard to folks that might not necessarily be familiar with that type of stuff. And then we also um, do education there. So our, we do university classes, lots of really great, unique university classes that just don't translate as well when you're talking about them out from a book. You know, like Wetland Ecology is so much more interesting if your boots are muddy than if you are just reading about wetlands um, in a textbook. And so we are so proud of the fact that we have a field station at the University of Akron. And we, we really appreciate that the upper administration at the University of Akron values the services that we can give to both our students at the university and our faculty at the university, but also to the wider community. So as I mentioned, we're located primarily at Bath Nature Preserve. We have a building there. We have a lease with Bath Township and a really great partnership. We're in the midst of a second 25-year lease with them. We also own a property that's the Pansner Wetland Wildlife Reserve. It was part of the Copley Swamp. It was drained in the early 1900s for agriculture as part of the uh, Copley Little Farms. And then it was um, restored to a wetland about uh, 15 years ago. And so it has this great story. It's an amazing place. Lots of cool um, ecology happening there, but also 
really interesting cultural things happening there too. So, you know, there's Native American artifacts on the property, just in between Pansner Wetlands and, our, and Bath Nature Preserve, a mastodon skeleton was, was found in one of those fingers of the Copley Swamp. And we have portions of that um, skeleton at the field station. Uh, so it's just, a, I got such a great story and it's a wonderful place to be able to talk about kind of the development and, and use of land over time. And then we have a tiny little property called Steiner Woods. It's adjacent to Bath Nature Preserve, 23 acres, uh, but has one of the longest salamander um, studies around, long-term salamander studies on the mole salamanders and their migration in the spring. So it's a great site. And we're hoping really to take a building on that property and turn it into a place where we can have artists and scientists working together um, to help educate folks about, um, about the benefits of both of those things. So just a little bit about me. I'm a bird nerd, but I'm not a very good birder. I'm always aligning myself with people who are very good birders, like Tim Colburn, who is here tonight. He's one of my um, BFFs, my best birder buddies there that I like to hang out with. Um, and, but I do love biology and I love nature. I, I've studied biology for for forever it feels like so and I am not from northern Ohio but I've lived here so long that I I claim it now so I love this part of the state I love being here I love that we have access to uh, McGee Marsh and the lakeshore and all of these wonderful places to go to go birding so here we are on some of our adventures um I did a lot I took my first ornithology class at John Carroll actually um, and really got interested in birds. And then when I started working at the Nature Center at Shaker Lakes, I got to bird band with Julie West and Gary Newman for you know the, my whole time that I was there. So I got to get kind of up close and personal with the birds. But Josh and I like to go out to the biggest week in birding. We follow all the smart people around and like let them tell us what we're seeing and hearing. But we just like being out there. We did a great crane migration trip with Tim and Mike Edgington uh, several years ago that was really fantastic and and absolutely one of the wonders of the birding world, of the natural world, actually, if you haven't been to a crane migration, I highly recommend it. So uh, I like to tag along with people like you all who are good at birding, and I'm fascinated by birds because uh, I think that they have such crossover. You know, they're gorgeous, they're beautiful, uh, they're smart, they're funny, um, you know, they can teach us about engineering and and migration and all kinds of really cool things. So they're just a wonderful topic and I'm really inspired by them. So we're gonna talk about birds now, of course. So here's one of my little buddies that hangs out with me at the field station here. These um, barn swallows sit and chatter and gossip on the line and love hanging out with them and getting to see their babies during the year. We really thought that 2020 was gonna be our year of the birds. So we had kind of planned ahead we had gotten a little grant to write this bird book that I'm going to tell you about later, and we planned this 2020 bird blitz. So the the swan and the binoculars make the year 2020, along with the guy's nose in that graphic. And we were just all set to hit the ground running. And then, of course, uh, we all know what happened. And so uh, the book became a kind of labor of love over email back and forth with my co-authors um, during the pandemic. And I have to say it was a great pandemic project, but it was not kind of the bird filled year that we thought it was going to be because we were all kind of stuck apart and stuck in our houses and you know trying to stay safe but one of the things that we did right before um, that happened was that Mike Edgington worked with the eBird folks to help set up some eBird hotspots at Bath Nature Preserve so uh, Bath Nature Preserve has 199 species that have been observed um, at the Nature Preserve. And I would invite you to come down or to plan one of your walks at Bath Nature Preserve. We'd love to host you down there. Um, but Mike also set up these um, regions of Bath Nature Preserve that are specific areas. So like Garden Bowl is a specific area of Bath Nature Preserve uh, that people can record their observations at. And so this was a really important part of writing our book because we were able to take a list of the species that people were seeing at Bath Nature Preserve and make sure that we were kind of hitting the most important species because we really wanted that to be kind of a place-based um, document. So when I started, there was a bluebird trail and it's pretty decrepit as you can see from this picture over here, the little tree swallow sticking his cute little face out. Um, and so we've begun taking down some of those older boxes and replacing um, some of them with newer boxes and 
trying to mobilize volunteers to help us with that um, bluebird trail. We have a really great person in Summit County named Marcy Grand from Ohio Bluebird Society who helps us with that um, bluebird trail upkeep. So this was kind of when I started there in 2015 was one of the first things that was very obvious that was happening at the at the field station property and kind of something that uh, I wanted to take on as a pet project. You know, as I get more and more responsibilities, it's hard to kind of keep up with this kind of stuff. So I'm looking for new volunteers to help with that that as we move on. We've also had some Boy Scout projects who have been focused on birds. So some of them built, um, you can see the, the duck, uh, the mallard rings and the uh, wood duck boxes in this picture. Um, and then we've also had them help with a, a bird feeder area that I'll talk about in just a minute. We do a lot of bird programming at Bath Nature Preserve. So part of our agreement with Bath Township is that we host about 12 um, outreach events a year for the community. So these are free of charge most of the time, unless we need to charge for like an artist fee for our nature and art workshops. Uh, most of these are free and we've had a, just a really fun time doing these. So we have owl prowls and woodcock walks, usually do a grassland bird hike. Um, and again, yeah, some of the nature and art workshops that we've had focused Specifically on birds have been like nest building workshops out of natural materials and things like that. Really super fun stuff. So unfortunately we haven't done owl prowls this year. We've had a really busy spring and there's just me and an AmeriCorps member that kind of is in charge of all of the programming at the field station. So we're gonna do some woodcock walk slash owl prowls slash, slash stargazing if the weather's nice walks next week down at the field station. And I will be posting something on our Facebook page uh, about those events soon and how you can register through Eventbrite because we'll try to keep the groups smaller than normal. The first time I did a owl prowl at the field station, it was my first year. We had a parking lot that could fit like five cars and I think we had 88 people show up. So it was a little, over, a little overwhelming and we started taking registrations after that. People love owls. I've got to tell, wow, that's amazing how people will mobilize for owls. Um, and owl pellets. It's pretty great. Uh, the Woodcock Walks also gave us our first opportunity at the beginning of the pandemic to make like a online, you know, presentation about Woodcocks. We really, the same as everybody else, I'm not super tech savvy. And so um, some of this stuff was a steep learning curve for us. And we really had to like think about how we're going to try to transform our programming to something that was virtual and online. And the Woodcock Walk was one of the first presentations that we did that way. So you can find it on YouTube if you search um, The Secret Life of the American Woodcock. Uh, so one of our other outreach uh, initiatives about birds has been these signs that we've made. I know you can't read them and that's not the point. You'll have to come visit us in the fall or spring to, to see what the signs actually say, but just the variety of birds that we have down there and that we wanted to highlight for um, people out walking the trails. So these are um, uh, signs that are stuck in the ground, like temporary signage that people walking the trails can stop and read a little bit, say about a great blue heron when they get near the garden bowl wetland or when they see the trumpeter swans out on the garden bowl nesting with their signets, they can read a little bit about them. Um, and then we, we leave them up for about a month and then we take them down and then we'll, we've now used these two years in a row. So this was our first, again, attempt at thinking about like, how do we help people passively appreciate nature when we aren't necessarily like leading hikes for them. And so this was a really fun thing. We gave them a bingo card. If they, if they found all the signs, they could turn it in and win a prize. We sent them something in the mail. It was really uh, a really fun effort. And so uh, that was fall into nature. In spring, we added some additional species that folks might be seeing. And this year we're even adding a couple more. So we have a big spring into nature with STEM Fest happening for the Revere School District kiddos at the end of April. And so they'll have a bunch of birds that they get to learn about on their, their stroll around the nature preserve. So we also have this really nice little bird feeder area. Uh, this is an old picture because all of the feeders have actually been replaced. This was right after Mark put them in, but we've replaced all the feeders. His baffles and his posts, however, are amazing and they've withstood um, quite a few years of time and the baffles are the best I've ever seen in terms of deterring the squirrels and chipmunks from getting up and eating all of our seed. We've replaced our windows. Um, so we put have brand new big picture windows in that classroom, which is um, great for all the students who are trying to avoid listening to 
their professor ramble on and on about well and ecology when they can stare out the window at the birds instead. Um, and we did work with Bath Volunteers for Service and Summit County Audubon to put these um, UV dots on those windows so that we can reduce bird strikes, which has been great and a good way for us to talk about um, you know, how we can help prevent bird strikes at our own house. So that's kind of a nice little feature of that area too. It also um, is spurred on a, a PBL with the Akron STEM High School. So PBLs are project-based learning. So they're projects with students where they are really actively involved with how the, the class is going. And so for this one, we asked the students to paint us bird panels to hang in our outdoor classroom based on the birds that they learned about in our bird book or, or from our a little presentation we put together about the most common birds that they would see at our feeders. And they really did an awesome job. They are so stinking cute. I cannot wait to hang these up outside this summer um, so that you know if the students pop by, they can see their artwork on the walls and we'll be able to cheer up some of our outdoor spaces a little bit with these be beautiful little bird murals. We also have a chimney swift tower going in this spring. So this is not your typical chimney swift tower, but this is a chimney swift tower that has been designed by a team of artists, um, the one at Kent and one at Akron, who are really um, working in these maker spaces. So um, this has been sponsored by Greater Akron Audubon Society and the money that they provided us is going to pay for the, the concrete footings that this needs to be able to remain stable outside. But basically it's like machine carved uh, high density foam that then gets coated with these concrete um, panels. Uh, so there's 3D printing involved and then also the CNC machines to carve out this high density foam. And so we're really excited about how it looks and we are really excited to see if it works. And I think that we'll have a little bit more information about that um, you know, this time next year, but we're gonna hope, hope for a summer installation on this. It's been many years in the works uh, and has proven quite difficult for the artists. So they're anxious to be kind of have it installed and be able to see what happens next. But here's kind of what it will look like in the landscape. So this kind of tornado-y looking thing, uh, chimney, and you can see it's quite big. So he's a big guy there, the, the artist helper, and that it's a pretty big tower. Um, and so we'll, we'll see how it goes. It's an exciting experiment. So the book that Nancy mentioned at the beginning is the Bath Bird, Bird Blitz book. I have the text backwards on here. It's too many Bs. The BBBB, I like to call it. Um, so we wrote a small grant for this before the pandemic um, to Bath Community Fund. And we asked for money to write this book thinking that this was kind of going to be a, an easy project and never again. Somebody emailed me like a week after the book came out and asked what my next book was going to be. And I like thought I was going to lose it. Like this was many, many, many more hours of work than I expected it to be. But it's also a really joyous project. We're very excited about it. Uh, the grant was able to help us um, donate 100 copies of the book to Bath Elementary School. And then Bath Elementary School went ahead and bought um, another 120 copies of that book so that every single fourth grader at Bath Elementary School this year got a copy of that book to take home. I mean, that feels amazing. So we're really excited about that. They're working on securing future funding to get at least a classroom set for the kids. And we're hoping that this can continue to be a really great partnership. So the book highlights 80 of the most common birds that you would see at Bath Nature Preserve. And then the checklist at the back has 180 of the species that are most commonly seen. And it's kind of an update on this bird list from Greater Akron Audubon. So here's some of the pages. It's really been such a pleasure to work on these with uh, my co-authors. My co so my um, one co-author, John Landis, took all the photography and then his son, um, Alexander, is the illustrator. So Alexander did all of these like delightful pictures of um, the birds that we didn't have really great photographs of, or even like, I, you know, added to pictures that his dad had taken, like the one with the indigo bunting, having it sing its song. Um, and he put the little fireflies in there. It just was a really a delightful project, fun to work on. Uh, we have scientific name, habitat, song, um, clues to use to find it, and then fun facts, as well as the seasons that it can be most likely seen in and the size. And we wanted to make it really fun for kids to read, 
Uh, so there's even like hidden little caterpillars all uh, throughout the book that the kids have to find as they look through. So we're really, really proud of this. It's like a 90 page book. I mean, we, we um, was a, like when it got done, I thought if I never have to read this book again <laughs> for a typos, <laughs> it will be too soon. But I, you know, now it's, it's worn off and I'm really proud of it. It's, it's a great little thing. And we feel like it's going to hopefully get kids inspired about birds. So here are some of the kids this year using um, the information that they learned in the bird book to present on these 3D bird models that they made. And they are so awesome that um, I wish that you could see them closer in these pictures, but I, I grabbed a few more so that you could see what they look like. So these are made by fourth graders. Like this is crazy. Like the one uh, eagle in front of the big eagle on the left-hand side um, or the hawk, it was made with something like 300 pieces of folded paper glued together to make that, that bird that's kind of laying uh, right, you know, next to the cardinal here in the, in the top left picture. These are just incredible little bits of art. And we feel like that the bird book is able to start these conversations with kids in a way that makes birding really accessible to him. And like how wonderful is it to think about inspiring the next generation of birders. I mean, we know how cool birders are, but like if we can get them started early in fourth grade being enthusiastic about these things, uh, this gives us real potential for having a great group of citizens who care about birds and bird ecology by the time that they're adults and, you know, wanting it to be part of a, a club like this. So it's really exciting. And I'm, I'm really happy that this is what came out of this bird book um, collaborative with Bath Elementary School. One fun thing that happened this summer was that I got to go to Hog Island um, in Maine. So I'm not sure how many of you guys have gotten to go to Hog Island, but if you haven't, I highly recommend it. It was really wonderful. And I got a scholarship through the, the um, Black River Audubon Society. And this has been a nice partnership because it's grown over time. I got to go give them a presentation about my trip to Hog Island, um, but we started talking about um, plastic pollution and the impacts on birds and they'll be joining another group that I belong to, um, Surfrider Foundation Northern Ohio at our first beach cleanup of 2022 out at Lakeside Landing in Lorraine on April 16th. And so um, being able to combine cleaning up beach plastic with some birding out there at uh, the marina in Lorraine is gonna be a really great new partnership that I'm pretty excited about. So um, stay tuned for more info on that. Uh, yeah, super great time. I had a blast. I was really actually quite nervous to go to camp. Like I didn't go to camp when I was a kid. So like to go to adult camp, <laughs> I was <laughs> having a little anxiety, but it was really wonderful. It was so fun. I met some great friends and anxious to stay in touch with them. And one other really amazing thing about this trip is that um, our our instructor group was a group of super diverse individuals. And that felt really nice. And because we really believe at the University of Akron that birding is for everyone. And you know, sometimes we really get kind of segregated in our own silos, both in academia and in life. And to see people of, of all ages and backgrounds and races um, and religions come together to do um, the Hog Island thing and also at the University of Akron Field Station is really important for us. And so uh, we are proud of the, the fact that we've been able to bring like almost 5,000 kids to the field station since 2015. And we provide all of those at no charge to our partner schools. So we don't charge for like a day use fee or anything like that. We don't charge if I go into the classrooms. And oftentimes if a school needs help um, uh, with transportation, we'll pay for their buses. So we have a little friends group, a University of Akron friends group that uh, helps offset all of those costs. and. You know, with that Little Bath Community Foundation grant, we were able to buy a classroom set of binoculars. And so just having tools on hand and um, wonderful volunteers on hand, like here's Mike Edgington standing up on that bench with all of those kiddos around, helping them see what's going on at the Garden Bowl. is just really, uh, it brings me such great joy. So here's Becky Donaldson. You might guys might know some of might know her. She was helping with a field trip one day, and that was a day that um, the the trumpeter swans' eggs hatched, and so the kids got to see like brand new baby cygnets swimming around. It was just totally cool. 
So uh, yeah, wonderful stuff happening at the field station with kids and birds. And once they get a pair of binoculars in their hands, they are just off and exploring. And it's just such a wonderful uh, thing to be a part of. Okay, so I'm very excited about this uh, new thing that's happening at the University of Akron, which is that we have uh, an unclass through our experiential learning center called Discovering the UA Museum of Zoology, a Natural History Mystery. So I was at a talk on ivory billed woodpeckers uh, quite a few years ago at the field station and somebody said to me, the University of Akron has an ivory billed woodpecker. And uh, this was news to me and I could not believe it. I mean, I was floored when I found out that this was indeed true. So this is our little female ivory billed woodpecker. She is um, at the taxidermist right now getting restored because she is like 125 years old. So she needs a little bit of help. Um, but this led me on to this treasure trove of all of these birds. So this is a picture of a professor that we ended up identifying who he was. And I think he was a professor at the university like in the 1950s or 60s. Um, and so you can see all of the, the birds that are there. Um, and we have all of these birds still in our collection. So we had started digging in because around the same time that I learned about the ivory billed woodpecker, I was contacted by a, um, an Akronite, a person that lives in Akron who is very passionate about the University of Akron and also happened to be um, an ancestor of Thomas and Sarah Rhodes. And he reached out to me and said, do you know anything about this bird collection that um, Thomas Rhodes donated to the university. And at that point in time, we did not know that the birds came from Thomas. So Jay was the missing link between who donated the collection and the collection itself. So aren't they a handsome couple? Uh, this picture of him is from a book that was written in the 1800s about notable um, people in Summit County. And it talks about how he um, served in the Civil War. He was an abolitionist. He was the president of the Akron Scientific Club. He was part of the Summit County Master Gardeners. I mean, this was like a Renaissance man in the Victorian age for sure. So we've also found records of him like discovering caches of arrowheads in Copley Township. I mean, he definitely was an interesting character and he definitely was interested in exploring his environment around Akron. So they lived here in downtown Akron. So the circle at the left-hand side of the screen is Rhodes Street at the time. That's where he lived. It's now Rhodes Avenue. And the circle in the middle, the orange circle in the middle of the screen is um, Bookdale College. So Bookdale College was the forerunner of the University of Akron and it was founded in 1870. So Thomas Rhodes lived down the street from the University of Akron at its founding. He probably um, rubbed elbows with, with John Bookdale and all of the people that were kind of instrumental in the founding of this university. And he obviously was a man um, of, that was interested in that idea of higher learning and science and uh, study and what was happening in the environment at this time. And, you know, if you think back on the late 1800s, this is when Darwin was putting forth his, um, you know, theory of natural selection. There was a lot of exciting things happening at this time and in colleges being founded and all of that stuff. So this is his, um, his obituary on the right and a picture of them in the middle of them in later years, you can tell kind of their gray hair. Um, and he's, it, his obituary says, Thomas Rhodes of Akron was a pioneer and a rich landowner. And at the top, it says he loved birds, um, his country and something else. I can't read it because my, the things in the way. Oh, and his church. So, you know, this is really cool. Like birds are getting as high a billing in his obituary as country and church. Like that's pretty amazing if you think about it, right? I mean, pretty cool. So we found these old newspaper clippings from 1904 and 1910 that he donated 600 specimens to the University of Akron. I mean, this is outstanding. And the, the, the clincher for me 
uh, because I hang out with a lot of very interesting, cool women who are bird nerds too, was that Sarah was the taxidermist. So actually our taxidermist at the university is a woman. And I just think that that's so cool because certainly the women in the Victorian era were doing very cool things like collecting plants and and seaweeds and, and mosses and those kinds of things. But to think about Sarah kind of getting in there as the taxidermist is pretty amazing. So, you know, we have all this information. We have, we have specimens, they're not labeled well. We don't know where they came from. That was part of the disappointment of the ivory-billed woodpeckers that we have no idea where it came from. We don't know what year it was collected. It just has a tag that says this is an ivory-billed woodpecker. So, um, but you know, it says that he traveled and to, uh, South and Central America and secured um, specimens in Panama. I mean, this guy was well-traveled. And to think about doing that kind of stuff um, back then is pretty amazing. And so it's just, it feels like it should be a book. It feels like it's its, its own kind of mystery novel. And that's totally what gets me excited. So this is Old Book Doll Hall at the university right after the university was founded. I mean, it's just amazing. I think about like, I would have loved to go to college at this time, just like these, you know, huge old buildings. And we found in 1882 that they had a natural history room. And these are kind of like these cabinets of curiosity, these ideas that learned people were putting things in cabinets and then inviting other learned people to come look at them, to admire them, to, to, to think about prestige and wealth to learn something about um, things that they didn't know about and to, to be together in these spaces, right? These are really the forerunners of our natural history museums. Um, very cool stuff. So this was in a yearbook. It has some information about where some of the specimens came from. Well, Old Book to Hall burned down in 1899. So we imagine that many, many, if not all of the natural history specimens in that room at that time were lost, although there are some anecdotal reports that people were grabbing books and specimens and running out of the, uh, of the, the hall. Book to Hall also burned down in the 70s. And at, this was um, part of where Rhodes's collection was stored um, in the 1910s. And so if they were if they were still there in 50 years later, we don't know, then they a lot of our specimens are pretty well damaged. They're pretty sooty looking, dirty, dusty type things. So again, this is concurrent happening at the same time as the Museum of Natural History up in Cleveland, which wasn't officially founded till 1922, but was kind of growing on this idea of these collections in 1836 and 1869. If there's a really great exhibit there now called um, the Cleveland Museum of Natural History 100 Years On. And this is a picture of the original archites. Here is on the wall up above them, this oil painting, you can see this box on the wall filled with birds. Well, that's this box right here. So they had this cabinet of birds in the original place of the archites. There's a really great book when I'm holding in the right picture is a book called The Archites. And it talks about the founding of the Museum of Natural History. But the, this idea was these were contemporaries of Thomas Rhodes. And you know, so they were all kind of doing and thinking the same thing. Here's my cute little class and me with my co-teacher Gary um, taking the kids to this exhibit. I call them kids, they're like adults, but they feel like my kids. So uh, it's fun to get to bring them to places like this and get have them get to explore a little bit of the area. So here's the start of some pictures of the Rhodes um, collection. And what we're having the students do is add them to a digital collection database because that has really been what's lacking for the last 125 years is any type of database. Um, so that we can be able to search them, know where they came from, know who they came from. So the students have so far um, taken down, I think like 70 individuals and gotten them photographed from all four sides um, and put in their tag information into an online database that will be preserved for much longer than maybe even the birds will be and will be accessible to the general public. We had a really nice article in the Akron Beacon Journal a couple of weeks ago so if you search for it, it's called Ivory Build Woodpecker Gets Top Billing at the University of Akron. Uh, but there's some nice photographs of the birds and students in there. So we've been able to take some of these uh, birds and do some artistic interpretations with them. So posing them in ways to get people to think about um, 
what these birds mean, what their lives meant, what what good are they now, what good are collections now. Uh, so we've been able to do some art with that. This will be on display at our, our end of the semester show. The students have gotten to get in there and get some cleaning done. So you mentioned the feather thief at the beginning, and we also have one of the um, uh, the the birds here with the big floopy tails. <laughs> I cannot remember its name right now, but um, yeah, so we, uh, we're we super uh, bird of paradise. We're super happy that we have some of these, but as you can see, they are in pretty rough shape. So they're dirty, dusty, kind of grimy. They're loaded with arsenic. So the kids are really like decked out head to toe in um, glasses, two masks, uh, gowns, gloves, every time they're interacting with the birds, because certainly we don't want anyone to get sick. Um, so we're we're hoping that they can um, you know, manage to get these guys cleaned up enough that at least we can show them off a little bit, even though they're obviously uh, a little bit rough around the edges. We've also been able to do these um, 3D scans of the birds and I'm probably running a little bit. Oh no, I'm doing okay, I think 8.30. So here, let me do, I wanna show you real quick. Let's see if it goes to this page. Can you guys see that page with three birds across it now or did it stay on the PowerPoint? three birds. So if we hit this uh, view in 3D, we're able to turn these birds around. Are you able to see a woodcock that's spinning around like a record player? No? No. Okay. Mm -mm. Let me see one second. Let me go back here. All right. I'm going to reshare. Hang on. I'm going to show you this. There we go. Hang on. This should work. Okay. Now can you see the woodcock spinning around? Yeah. Yes. So the Meyer School of Art has been able to, and we could zoom in on this, um, and this obviously we don't have text up here yet, but this is a um, uh, taxidermied bird done by Maria Burke, uh, who is our taxidermist for the field station. And so we are able to take her scans, since they're not quite as dirty or as disgusting as the um, birds in the collection, and make them so that they're accessible to people so that they can feel like they're picking the bird up and turning it over in their hand and really like getting up close and personal. You can zoom in on these feathers and see dust on the feathers. I mean, it's really, really incredible technology. And so we feel super excited about the fact that we're able to um, share things in such detail. Um, hang on one second. All right, I'm back. Am I sharing again or no? Did I lose myself? Hang on. Hold on, okay. I don't know where my actual, let's try again. All right, let me get back down to uh, where we are. We're almost at the end. You guys have been good troopers. Okay, uh, so, so we have this 3D database that we're gonna be able to share and add to over time. This is um, the short-eared owl that Maria did for us and the woodcock she did for us and the scrub jay is one of the original uh, birds in the collection. And so we'll be, Having QR codes available at our art show, um, April 29th is the opening, but we will have birds on display at the um, Akron Summit County Library in downtown branch um, for I think a month, probably like the month of May. And then uh, the, there, there'll be an exhibit that's a combination of students from the art school and my students from the natural history mystery class, putting together an exhibition at the Cummings Center for Psychology at the University of Akron campus. Uh, they have an Institute of Human Cultures and we're gonna have uh, two spaces within that building where we're able to show off some of the birds as long as we can keep them under glass or behind glass, as well as this other idea of like these cabinets of curiosity. So the idea that people collect things in order to kind of tell a story about their surroundings and to display things like wealth or curiosity to um, friends or strangers, colleagues is really intriguing to us. And so we're excited to share that information with other people. We'll also have some really beautiful art by another artist um, called, uh, Mar whose name is Maria Uhazy, who does these really kind of gothic interpretations of nature. So kind of macabre looking nature, maybe blood and guts and beautiful bird heads and flowers all mixed together. And that really kind of ties together the idea of the taxidermy and the art and these cabinets of curiosity all together. So 
we're really excited. It's starting to come together now. I, I mean, I feel a little bit unsure of how it will all end up in its entirety, but I'm sure it'll be great. So, um, and that's all I have. I really am so appreciative of Nancy asking me to tell you about all the fun stuff we do about birds at the University of Akron. It's one of the greatest pleasures of my job is to get to get other people of all ages excited about the nature that's right in our own backyard. And um, yeah, birds, of course, are just such an integral, wonderful, joyous part of that. And I'm so excited to be able to share it with folks. So I've left my contact information here. I'll leave it up for a little bit. Um, you can email me if you know a school of a school that wants a field trip or somebody to come do in-classroom work. We're pretty much booking out to the fall right now, but we'd be happy to talk to teachers. If you'd like to do a field trip at Bath Nature Preserve, um, we would love to, to work with you on that, to schedule something, host you at the field station, whatever might be convenient. Um, yeah, any way that we can help get the word out about birds, we'd be happy to. And I think that's it. I want another hour's worth. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you. Thank amazing. You. Just, whew, I don't know where you get the energy. <laughs> I'm tired. No, um, I'm going to open up the, the, you know, so folks, you can unmute and ask questions. I don't see any questions in the chat yet, but I would love to, you know, have a discussion or again, just toss out some questions. I know I put in the chat how important, just not learning about birds through biology, but the art and the literature and photography and 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 history and oh my gosh i mean there's so many ways that things can be tied in yeah and it's like one little thread i mean it's i just love that you guys are going to read the feather thief because we talked about that um actually on our first class you know that this is actually a really valuable collection but it's been basically just kind of shoved in a closet it got used um, for classes on occasion you know there were orna we had wonderful ornithologists at the university of akron so we had um, Matt Shockey, who was the ornithologist that studied fossil bird coloration and feathers. We had um, Ann Wiley, who was studying isotopes in, um, in albatross. We had um, Greg Smith, who was my, uh, the, the person that had the field station manager job before me. He studied birds. So we've had great ornithologists. We've been really blessed in that, but they've all left. And so we don't have anybody kind of like rah rahing for this collection now. And for me, that that feels really meaningful. Like these little dirty, soot covered, dusty birds need somebody to advocate for them that they are they're worthy and that they they have a place in both educate. We also have, I mean, besides all of those, the taxidermy birds, like the stuffed birds that are posed and mounted, we have drawers and drawers and drawers and drawers of study skins which we don't even know what's in there yet, right? I mean, this is probably a multi-year project just to be able to sort through those drawers, find out what we have. Some of the taxidermy birds are stuck in the, in the drawers with the skins. So we don't even, like the collection isn't even well separated. You know, it's like, it's digging through a, a mound of history. And that to me is that little thread that connects everything, like getting to learn about Thomas Rhodes and his connection to my friend Jay. And, you know, it, it's just incredible. It's just like, how, how could you not love digging into your own little mystery, right? Right in your own place of work. Oh, that's a great question, Mike. We don't accept any birds right now, but we could once we get our salvage permit back up. So um, part of one thing that was really stressful to me at the beginning was like, I couldn't find any permits um, for anything like when I started. And I'm really stressed about that stuff because we have salvage permits for the field station. I keep you know track of everything. And um, the... I called and talked to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and they were like, oh, you're a public university. You don't need the collection permits because you, your grant, you know, you have this clause and he sent me the clause that we were in and covered by. But he said, if you accept new birds, you'll need a salvage permit. And just because we've had such faculty attrition over the years, that stuff hasn't been kept up to date for the University of Akron. We have a... Um, of salvage permit for the field station, but we don't have a huge budget to like do the taxidermy and the prep or the people for lights out 
Akron. We'd like to, and, and we definitely, there was a little, um, we're hoping to put it in the show. There was a little initiative on campus to check out the Polymer building. I don't know if you guys know the Polymer building at the University of Akron, but it's a big glass building that kind of sits back on campus. So students were walking around that several times a day during migrations to count the birds that had hit that building specifically because it's all glass. And so I think that there is some interest about it on campus, but not enough really to like kind of mobilize a task force of people that are needed to do that stuff. It was great to be able to show the kids what people are doing at Lights Out Cleveland and they got to see how the birds were being prepped. They were super interested to hear that like every little bit of that bird was being salvaged somehow. The wings to the museum, the guts to the somebody in Texas, the ectoparasites to somebody else, you know, really just like how much data can be gotten from those birds that have sacrificed their lives because we are not good at planning where we put our buildings or how we use our glass and lights. Great question, Mike. Thanks. Anyone else? Hi, Tim. Did you like your picture? Thank you. Hey, I had a question for you. I actually had a question for you. So all those skins, I think I've asked you this before, but all those skins, there, there's some Western birds in there. There's some, I saw limpkin, I saw magpie, the scrub jay. Do we know if some of those birds are being claimed to have been collected in Ohio? No, I don't think so. I think he traveled quite widely. So okay. I think that he was a traveler. And so unfortunately the old birds, like I said, the tags are, are the, un, the unfortunate part of them is that they are not a wealth of information. So they don't have who they're collected by. Also, some of the taxidermy is terrible. Like, I mm. mean, I'm not trying to be mean to the, to whoever taxidermy them, but like we have a loon, we're going to put him in the show because he's bird number zero, zero, one. So he has to go in, right? He's the first bird in the collection, but he looks like he's sitting in an easy chair, ready to like drink his afternoon cocktail. Like he's in the weirdest loon pose you've ever seen in your whole life. You're like, loons do not sit like that on their butts. Like that is not like a pose for a loon. So um, at all of those early specimens, don't have where they were collected, don't know, we don't know who collected them, and we don't know the date of collection. So those we assume were all from this Thomas Rhodes collection with just very poor data attached to them because they're so old. The study skins that we have are, are like, they say the collector, the date, the year, where they were collected. And those, we do have some that will say like, this was given to us by a different museum of, nat of natural history, like a Denver, University of Denver's museum. And so I think that's part of like the mystery is the sorting out of this, like, unfortunately, no data to data. And, you know, as a scientist, I was just really dismayed at first, like, well, this, this, these birds are meaningless, but the, the the thing that saves them is the story. And so I think that that's why this class is so important because the story saves them from being meaningless. It tells a story about what Akron was like in the late 1800s. It tells a story about the Rhodes and their family. And it, it tells a story about you know philanthropy and, um, and how natural history museums got started. And I, that's what we're trying to convey as best we can. You know, It is a shame though, that we just have the, the, it's just a dearth of data, you know, really, yeah. it's just not there. Yeah, it really, uh, really starts up the curiosity when you see mm -hmm. all those different birds from all over. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, see, so you're, oh, you're, I, you're, one thing I forgot to, I, go, go ahead. Go, sorry, go ahead, Nancy. I was, well, was going to say, you're looking, thing. you're looking at it as a scientist, we, you know, no data, no data, right. <laughs> but, you know, look at it from a different perspective. Yeah. I mean, to look through kids' eyes, you know, come and look right. at this loo lounging loon. <laughs> the lounging loon. I'm going to name him that in the show. I'm going to name him the lounging loon. That's great. Yeah. And it, and it even says like actually in the newspaper article from 1910, like the goal was to engage with students and teachers in the Akron area. And like, how fun is that now that 112 years later, like we get to do that instead. 
you know, so whether or not they did it well 112 years ago or not, doesn't really matter. Like now we get to do that. One of my students is doing exactly like an outreach type um, thing for teachers, a little bit of curriculum using the bird specimens. And so it's, it's really exciting. And Friday, um, I'm going with Carrie Elvey from the wilderness. These are like my rock star nerd friends. So Carrie Elvey from the, the Wilderness Center, Jamie Emmert from ODNR, Maria Burke, who's an artist and a taxidermist. We're all going to the Carnegie Museum of Natural History and we're getting like a five hour lesson in how to clean bird tax <laughs> taxidermy by the curator of the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. I mean, like we're like jumping out of our skins. We're so excited. And I told Josh tonight, I'm like, it's only these women that I could do this with and feel like I am not an oddball, right? This is like a very <laughs> cool experience that we'll get to have. And so hopefully it will be something that comes back to the university that can be really beneficial um, to the collection. And, you know, maybe someday we'll find a donor that wants to help us get, you know, cases that we can put stuff on display and switch stuff out so that they continue to be a, a public source of inspiration for folks. You're not an art ball. The <laughs> folks, see the folks on this. There, are folks that stuck with you. The student. There's going to be some students. Lara, just I'm like, jealous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Thanks, I know. Allison, it's good to see you too. Hey, I want to take Friday off here. <laughs> I want to take Friday off and go with you guys. I'm going to take so many pictures. I'm going to. We're going to be so nerded out. I just can't even believe it. Yeah, it's going to be so. No, great. and I also just. I don't have a question, but I love all the cross connections you're making with the the surf rider group and the plastics. And I, I mean, what what a great um, way to make it relevant and and pertinent. And also, but that's not the collection. That's your Hog Island camp. But you know, and what a way to get a new audience into looking at the birds uh so yeah it's exciting i'm inspired well thanks me thanks. too you're a rock star thanks you guys are <laughs> bird so star. Glad. like i said at the beginning i'm glad to have friends that are better birders than me then i just get to go out for cool nature hikes like tim is like a bird encyclopedia if y'all haven't birded with tim he like just names things off like as you're driving and then also gives you facts it's it's he's my most most favorite birder friend because of that well the the truth be told uh we needed something to do when we were driving 15 hours at a day to get out to nebraska to see those cranes so <laughs> uh, we we're entertaining each other <laughs> it was it was good all righty well i thank everybody this evening thank you thank you laura that was fabulous i uh i'm inspired so thank you wonderful Thanks. yeah and thank you everybody again have a good evening um and join us on some of our field trips if you're able to the tremont trips are a blast and our woodcock watches are a blast so second saturday uh field trips are a blast and come to our picnic too if you can all right thank you have a good Thanks evening, so much, everyone. everybody. Have a great night. Happy birding. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.